The spheres of influence established by the Sykes-Picot Agreement soon metamorphosed into the borders of nation-states, proto-nation-states, established by the League of Nations mandate system. We're going to examine the basis of the League of Nations mandate borders, their status in international law, and their status today, at a time when the post-World War I reorganization of the Middle East has come into question, we will see that the questions about the borders of the states that arose after World War I in the Middle East are not new ones. The borders were controversial and caused problems from the very beginning. Some of these problems raised issues that we will find reminiscent, and we'll see how international law addressed these issues in ways that are quite interesting. In numerous situations, in the Middle East and also elsewhere, the borders created by League of Nations mandates created controversies involving territorial sovereignty disputes with neighboring nations, controversies about internal denials of ethnic self-determination, controversies about coherence and independence of these borders, conflicts about the resource allocation implicated in these borders. These controversies, which often involved considerable equities on both sides, resulted in proposals for cession, partition, and rejoinder of mandatory territories, and these proposals were taken extremely seriously. They were entertained by the mandatories, by the League of Nations, Mandates Count Commission, and various commissions of inquiry during the mandatory period. However, in all of these cases, and all of these disputes, which were quite heated in their day, as we'll see, the mandatory borders as they stood at the moment of independence of the successor nation state became universally and immediately regarded as the sole legitimate borders of that country. And we'll discuss such now arcane matters as the Mosul question of the 1920s, the Alexandretta con uh, controversy of the 1930s. And these were some of the most heated political disputes, territorial disputes of the day. And we'll see that once they were resolved by the creation of a subsequent nation state, the borders of those nation states rendered moot all pre-existing disputes, conflicts, proposals of partition, proposal of redrawing of borders, even though none of those underlying issues disappeared. But from a legal perspective, we'll see that they disappeared. And we'll find out the reason, we'll find out the reason why. So we'll talk about two conflicts uh, involving the borders of Mesopotamia, Iraq, and two conflicts involving, uh, involving the borders of Syria and Lebanon, the Brit British mandate of Mesopotamia and the French mandate uh, over Syria and Lebanon. Uh, and they raised various kinds of controversies, all of which are quite substantial. So the uh, Mesopotamian uh, mandate saw conflicts and substantial controversy over both its northern and southern borders. The dispute over its northern border is what came to be known as the Mosul question, right? capital M, capital Q. It was a, a matter of uh, serious international import. And the Mosul question had to do with who gets the entire, basically, northern third of Iraq, the uh, Mosul region, which was claimed by Turkey after the, uh, uh, after the Treaty of Severs, and the border had not yet been fully demarcated and adjusted. Whether Mesopotamia, whether uh, pardon, Mosul, the region of Mosul, would go to the predominantly Arab Iraq or to Turkey, was a question that was undetermined. Turkey had various historical claims. Iraq had various claims. And this led to a significant international inquiry. The matter was submitted to arbitration by the League Council, the League of Nations uh, Mandates Council. The League itself import, uh, appointed uh, an investigative commission, which issued recommendations. Questions of self-determination were considered, like what do the Kurds want? Uh, the question of Kurdish uh, self-determination played a, played a role in this. Now, the question of se Kurdish self-determination was posed in the following way. Uh, do the Kurds want self-determination by being part of the Arab Iraq or by part of the, 
Turkish Turkey. Uh, whether the Kurds wanted self-determination as being part of the Kurdish Kurdistan was not a question that was posed to the Kurds. Uh, and the theory was uh, the Kurds probably wanted to be part of Iraq more than they wanted to be part of Turkey. Uh, and so that's how the matter was decided, despite the British having made some self-determination uh, promises at various points to the Kurds and various armed Kurdish uh, insurrections in, uh, d during the period. So despite significant conflict between Turkey, the Kurds, and Iraq over the status of Mosul, when it was finally incorporated into Mesopotamia during the mandate, at the moment of Iraqi independence, there was no longer any question about sovereignty over Mosul. Such that even today, when we have a de facto independent Kurdish state in the Mosul region, something that looks like a state, acts like a state, it is invariably treated by the international community as part of Iraq. Because the borders created by the mandate are treated as the decisive borders. Another dispute happened on the other end, on the other end of Iraq, involving the border, the southern frontier, with the Emirate, Emirate of Kuwait. The border, uh, the southern frontier of Mesopotamia was only demarcated, roughly, in the 1922 Oker Protocol of the Treaty of Mahamara, which was principally about determining the border with Saudi Arabia, but also demarcated roughly the border with Kuwait. Upon independence, Iraq expressed great displeasure at how the border had been drawn by the mandatory power, by Britain. So these mandatory borders are not fair and laid claim to substantial parts of Kuwait. Now, these claims are actually non-trivial. The Iraqi claims to Kuwait were non-trivial. It is indeed true the border was arbitrarily drawn by Britain, uh, who was very sympathetic to the Kuwaiti emirs. The Kuwaitis also didn't like the border, by the way. Uh, the Iraqis had, a, on the equities, non-trivial claim. Kuwait, an emirate of almost no people at the time, received 300 some miles of Gulf coastline. Iraq, one of the most densely populated states in the Middle East, received 32 miles. Hardly seems fair. Iraq maintained this position very strongly at the moment of Kuwaiti independence in 1961 and mobilized its army and threatened to invade the new emirate to readjust the border. Uh, the international co uh, community at the United Nations condemned this move and Britain uh, sent forces to Kuwait to be prepared to repel this. And of course, the United States acted similarly in the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990. Thus, we see that the Iraqi claim to a redrawing of its southern border precedes certainly Saddam Hussein, dates back to the mandatory period, and despite significant equitable arguments about the misdrawing of the mandate, the difficulty it makes for Iraqi self-sufficiency, those claims were rejected by the international community because however the Uke Air Protocol was drawn up, and it was mostly drawn by taking a straight line and just going like that, uh, it doesn't matter. The, at the moment of independence, those were the borders, and the international community has treated them as the unassailable borders. Two controversies involved the French mandate for Lebanon and Syria. Mount Lebanon had always been an autonomous area of the, or always uh, since the 19th century, had been an autonomous Maronite area of the Vilayet of Damascus. However, when the French, as mandatories, partitioned Lebanon from Syria to create a separate, predominantly Christian state, as was mentioned this morning by Professor Rabinovich, they padded the area of Mount Lebanon by giving it, to, uh, giving it also the coastal city of Tripoli and uh, some of the uh, lucrative Be uh, Becca Valley farm, hinter farm hinterland. This was supposed to give it depth, an agricultural base, to create what you would call today a, a viable Christian state, uh, to make it viable. Now, this was greatly resented 
by Arab nationalists in Damascus who challenged the legitimacy of drawing the, redrawing the internal borders of the Vilayet of Damascus and also on ethnic self-determination grounds. The inhabitants of these regions, of the Tripoli and Bekaa Valley regions, were not predominantly Christian. How can you put them under the Christians? These are all fair-sounding claims. Nonetheless, since the moment of Lebanese independence, the borders of Lebanon, the, the internal politics of Lebanon, have been a tumult, but the external borders have been treated as internationally sacrosanct. Now, perhaps the most interesting case involves Alexandretta, or Hatay, depending on where you stand, uh, which was the northwestern corner of Syria under the mandate, under the French mandate. It had, uh, on the border between Syria and Turkey, it had an extraordinarily cosmopolitan population, Arabs, Armenians, Greeks, Turks, Jews, uh, and was a source of great friction with uh, Turkey. Turkey had uh, significant claims to it. And throughout the 1930s, Turkey asserted greater demands for greater control. France implemented increasing plans of autonomy for, uh, for the region. But nonetheless, uh, Ankara con uh, continued to insist on control over this, uh, over this area, which had a Turkish plurality, but not majority, had a very large Turkish pop uh, population. And throughout the 30s, there were riots there, uh, that, there was, uh, that were at least instigated in part uh, by uh, Kamalist forces. Uh, there was an appeal by Turkey to the League of Nations Commission, uh, which partially noted the validity of Turkish demands and demanded even greater autonomy for the region. Uh, and this may sound uh, also familiar. B uh, between 1937 and 1938, there were at least four different French, I would call them, peace plans for uh, greater autonomy uh, and uh, cession of Hatay, of Alexandretta from Syria. Uh, none of this was enough for Turkey, and ultimately in 1939, uh, France, eager to have Turkish support in a coming war with Germany, simply ceded Hatay to Turkey, uh, at which point most of the non-Turkish population fled. Now, what's interesting about this is aside from the self-determination issues, the French action was quite clearly a violation of Article 4 of the mandate for Syria, which provided, much like the Palestine mandate did, that no part of the Syrian mandate shall be placed under the control of a foreign country. And here France goes and shoom, nip and tuck, cuts Hatay off and gives it, to, uh, gives, gives, it, gives it to Turkey. Despite the rather clear violation of the provisions of the League of Nations mandate, at the moment of Syrian independence in 1943, Hatay was not part of Syria. It had been, the border had been redrawn by the mandatory power, perhaps incurring an independent legal violation, but nonetheless, the border of mandatory Syria, as administered in 1943, did not include Alexandretta. And thus, despite the fact that the Alexandretta Hatay dispute has remained a live one between Syria and Turkey, you know, basically to this day, the international community invariably recognizes the legitimacy of Turkish sovereignty over Alexandretta. Syria has never made that concession, by the way, and I think it is not a coincidence that the Russian fighter plane downed over Turkish airspace was downed in the area of Hatay, an area that remains extremely sensitive to Turkey, knowing Syria's continued uh, territorial demands. We see a pattern here. We see, despite the fact that every single mandate involved the denial of certain claims of ethnic self-determination, involved the denial of some other countries' claims to resources, contiguity, or other politically attractive features. Despite the fact that these mandates were controversial in their day, despite the fact that there were widespread calls for partition and redrawing of their borders, and maybe some of these claims were meritorious from an equitable perspective, in all these cases, the borders of the mandatory entity as it stood at the moment of independence became the universally recognized borders of the successor country. This is not a surprise because this is, turns out is a basic rule of international law. 
which Ambassador Baker referred to, uti potidetis juris. A uti potidetis juris is a rule about how you figure out the borders of new countries. And that rule says, when a new country is born, don't try to think out, figure out what are just borders or good borders, because in that case, every time a new country is born, there would be open conflict about every inch of its borders. Everything would be up for grabs. Rather, the borders are automatically locked in to the borders of the last existing geopolitical unit there. So, for example, Soviet Union collapses. What are the borders of the new countries when they declare independence? The borders of the previous Soviet republics. Is that fair? Is that nice? Does it have anything to do with self-determination? No. Let me give an example. Uh, take Crimea, for example, as uh, Russia recently did. Uh, <laughs> The international community does not recognize largely Russia's claim to Crimea. Now, it's important to note that Russia's claim to Crimea is non-trivial. Because Ukraine cannot base its claim to Crimea on self-determination. Most of the people in Crimea wish to be part of Russia. They cannot base it on ethnic commonality. Most of the people are not Ukrainian. They cannot base it on historical title. Crimea has almost always been part of Russia. Rather, in the 1950s, the general secretary of the Central Committee of the Soviet Communist Party, Nikita Khrushchev, did himself a little nip and tuck and made a present of Crimea to Ukraine. Was it nice? Did it involve consulting the local population? No, and no one cared much because everyone was still being governed from Moscow anyway. However, at the moment of independence, Crimea was within Ukraine's borders, the borders of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, and that's what the international community goes by. We also see, by the way, the exact same kind of thing that played out in the Middle East, playing out in a variety of mandates, League of Nations mandate ter territories in Africa. And uh, I can't go into the details here, but in my paper with Avi Bell, uh, we examine the long forgotten U controversy over the denial of uh, independent state to the U people, who you've never heard of, uh, but who were split up amongst uh, British and French Togo lands uh, in a way which denied them a state of their own. Many people thought that the uh, U should have uh, their own state. Nonetheless, in the end, the borders of the respective Togo lands became the borders of the respective countries. Or the famous South Cameroon dispute uh, dealing with uh, ethnic secessionist claims in British South Cameroon. Nonetheless, the border or the Burund Burundi Rwandi. Uh, question. Nonetheless, in all these cases, the borders of the mandatory, ter mandatory territories, despite calls for partition and redrawing during the mandatory period, become the borders of the uh, resulting successor state. Now, of course, there's one mandate that we didn't mention, the uh, mandate for Palestine. The mandate for Palestine, I need not tell you, also faced much criticism because of its borders. And there were many calls, such as by the United Nations General Assembly, for partition, redrawing, and fundamentally rethinking the borders of this geopolitical entity. Nonetheless, those proposals did not come to fruition, and the presumptive borders of Israel, our study of other mandatory borders would suggest, at the moment of its independence, which is the moment these things are determined, would be exactly the borders of the British Mandate for Palestine, uh, and no more and no less. Uh, thank you very much.